five guys that could win the championship. I go to kill him after the race and he escapes. I knew I was a rabbit. I knew everybody was chasing me because I was a foreigner. I helped get that son of a bitch approved so he could run for the championship. It was, it was pretty intense. The atmosphere was very charged. It really was a special day in the history, I think, of U.S. motocross. This was motocross at its greatest. Tears combined with acrid exhaust fumes from lightweight but high horsepower machines mounted by a new breed of rider. This is the story of the fastest, toughest, most spectacular new sport on the American scene, motocross. National champs from Pele to Ali generally fly to wherever their battles are staged, but U.S. motocross king Jimmy Weinert often rides shotgun in a van with his personal mechanic, Bill Bushka. In motocross, the battles are fought weekend after weekend on different tracks in far-flung states under all kinds of weather conditions. Jammin' Jimmy, as he is affectionately known, follows the 500cc national motocross circuit from coast to coast. He and Bushka are top members of Yamaha's factory racing team. Also following the circuit are factory riders and mechanics sponsored by all the biggies in motorcycle manufacturing, as well as the independents, riders often sponsored by no one but themselves. Together with assorted family and friends, these modern-day motorcycle gypsies converge at tracks all over the country to compete in races sanctioned by the American Motorcycle Association. The AMA sanctions a series of five races, for example, to determine who will ride with the number one plate in the 500cc or open class. 500s are the biggest, meanest machines in all of motocross. It takes the tops in skill, power, and endurance to bring that kind of bike under the checkered flag race after race. national class the motors will be 40 minutes plus two laps the AMA is there for all professional racing in the United States their rule book is followed under the watchful eye of officials trained to spot any tiny abnormality in bike or rider safety is the key word behind most rules in the AMA's good book but checking for cheating is another serious responsibility had to go through tech the bike that you brought through tech with a sticker on the main frame is the bike that you must ride today, unless you've made other arrangements. Spokes and axles are checked for tightness, and each rider's jersey, leathers, and helmet must meet AMA requirements. Make sure the axle is steel. 
Handlebars have to be steel. Have to have a twist throttle. Snap. Holding foot pegs at 45 degrees. Jimmy Weinert is the defending national champ going into the New Year's series. He switched allegiance between seasons from Kawasaki and won the opening race mounted on a Yamaha. Jim wants to hold on to that number one plate, and he's well on his way to doing just that after winning the opening round of the series out in Kansas. I usually fly in Friday and take it easy, and uh, yesterday was too easy. I had uh, the mail. The mail trip express, I was up and down about six times. Got here about 9.30 last night, pretty exhausted. And yeah, Saturday, just kind of work on the bike. And, you know, I mean, it's all worked on from the week, but little things, and we jet it, make sure that the carburetion is proper, and just kick back, you know, come out and enjoy the woods like this, and just have a good time, you know, relax a little bit. Just get away from the other riders and things. Uh, I just like to be on my own, kind of, I think. I used to be into a different scene, but now it's, uh, I don't know, maybe I'm growing up, I don't know. You know, it's just nice to be uh, by yourself. And, uh, you know, i got my wife and my little baby at home, and so, you know, it's I got different things to think about. And you know, I don't I don't need all the excitement. Just winning is enough excitement for me now. That keeps me going. Well, actually, I start concentrating, you know, beginning of the year or beginning of the series, whichever series it is, or certain races I know when I can really, really do good, or some ones when I know I don't feel too well, but I know that I can hang in there and get a, maybe an easy second or third, maybe hopefully for, for a win. You know, because you can't win everything. It's really hard to win everything. You, you really have to be up for it. and that's, It's really hard to do, you know. So I just hope for the best, you know, just go out and, and ride my hardest and take what comes to me. Yeah, I've been racing since I was 15. My father wouldn't let me race until I was 15, and he made me do 100 push-ups before I could race. And. Uh, you know, but it proved out. I won my first 23 races straight from amateur into expert. So, you know, it's, it's kind of nice. And uh, then I've been, you know, I did some professional flat tracking. I, uh, Gary Nixon sponsored me, who was then two-time, you know, net grand national champion. And then I got off a couple times, and I said, I, I don't like hitting these walls and stuff. You know, I just, just dumb things that I did. And, uh, you know, you don't walk away from too many of them. So I said, oh, I think motocross is safe. You know, if you go over the handlebars, you can come back. Gaining rapidly on the jammer is fellow Californian Billy Grossi. He's nicknamed Sugar Bear for that Yogi Bear-like thick curly hair. A youthful veteran of both Honda and Kawasaki factory teams, Billy has just signed on with Suzuki, and he's fresh from winning the 250cc class in the Florida Winter Series, the spring training of American Motorcycle Association motocross racing. One of the youngest and one of the hottest new stars in the country is Billy's teammate on the Suzuki crew, 18-year-old Tony DiStefano. He's winding down, having won the 250cc national title earlier in the year. Prior to that, in that spring training of motocross at the Winter AMA Series, he took the championship for the 500cc bikes. Tony is a living testimonial to the fact that motocross is a young man's sport. He won his first national series event at the age of 17. Texan Kent Howerton is Husqvarna's top American rider. He's one of the best 250cc jockeys around and actually won more series races in that 250cc national chase than did the ultimate champion Tony DiStefano. Tony put together a more consistent string of finishes to take the win. Still, Kent, the rhinestone cowboy, and his fellow under-20 racers figure to get a crack at Jim Weinert's number one in the 500cc class. Kent Howerton's buddy, fellow Texan Steve Stackable, rides on the factory Mako team. Short Stack is a rarity among motocross riders. He's six feet two inches tall. The nickname works in reverse. A less humorous reversal for short stack this year has been the persistent unreliability of his bike. He's had problems stringing two good motos together all season, but he's a strong competitor who won the important season's opener at Daytona. A 
Holland's old man of motocross, Pierre Carsmaker's The Flying Dutchman, attracted to this country by the big race purses. What makes me ride motocross? Because I love it so much. I like it really a lot, and uh, that's why I'm doing it. If I didn't like it, I wouldn't do it. I would do something else. We just finished the 250 series, and uh, I was very unlucky, I think unlucky in that. And I'm really looking forward to start uh, the 500 National Series now. 500 class is the class I like the most anyway. So I really like to start racing again in the open class. There are a lot of riders that say, well, the American, or European riders that say, well, the American motocross races are a lot easier, the tracks are too smooth and everything, but if they have to race these races over here, it's the same for everybody. And, you know, it's, they don't realize that. So I think motocross over here is similar like a motocross over there. The competition today is very tough. Tony Di Stefano is really on the gas at the moment. He has won the 250 National Championship Series already. He's won the Summer Series. And uh, he's really hot at the moment. Also, Steve Stackville is really good. Gary Simix is really good. He's second right now in the national standings. And there are a lot of good riders. Kent Howerton, Jimmy Ellis. So it's going to be tough. Four laps before the end, if I'm still not first, I'm still trying to get that lead. And uh, there's only one place to finish in that first place. Second and third don't count. I only like to win. That's, where I, that's why I'm here. Pierre Carsmaker showed just how hungry he is during the second race of the season held in Mexico, New York. He blasted off the line and hid from everyone in the first grueling 45-minute moto. He left Howerton and Weinert behind to hassle over second place. Actually, each moto length is based on a formula of 40 minutes plus two laps for the lead rider. As any top competitor can tell you, build into that formula a real element of fatigue. Motocross is non-stop, bone-jarring, muscle-mashing pressure. Pierre powered his big 400cc Honda works bike around the rough and sandy Moto Masters track and for Honda claimed a first ever win in open national competition. Between motos, a general state of physical collapse prevails. The riders wind down from the first 45 only to have to wind up again for the second. Toward the end of the moto, fatigue caused Howerton to drop off the pace and De Stefano crashed. The jammer cruised across the checkered flag to take the final moto, but Carsmakers had the lowest combined score from both motos, and thus he took the overall win. Jimmy was second and held on to a healthy point lead for the championship as a result of his strong finish in Kansas. The Dutchman had done poorly in that one, but it was becoming increasingly obvious that competition would get keener. Weinert knew he needed strong finishes in all five races if he was going to hold on to number one. <laughs> 
the moving motocrossers pack up their vans and transporters and hit the road in search of next week's race down under the Mason-Dixon line a bit in Axton, Virginia. trip for a motocross champ is to live in Europe much of the year and race in the world championships. That's just what Brad Lackey does. After winning the American title back in 1972, Brad became a member of Husqvarna's European team and he's been in the world championships ever since. He's just finished sixth in the 500 world standings and then decided to return to America. When the caravan of riders slowly filtered into the Virginia countryside, Lackey was there waiting for them. He had no real chance of winning the series, but that didn't stop him from wanting to play the game. Exactly how significant was the entry of Brad Lackey? Well, that wouldn't be determined until later on, in a cloud of smoke and the bitterest motocross battle to date. Rivalries are at least temporarily forgotten when all the riders and mechanics get together the day before a race. Everyone usually checks into the same motel in advance of Sunday's scramble. It's here that sign-in and bike inspection are held. And it's the one real time for relaxing, getting loose, renewing friendships after a week of working on the bike and traveling to the next race. It's no wonder that Saturday is reserved for little else than relaxing. Sunday's tension builds up soon enough. Pit Tootsies is the highly chauvinistic handle used to describe female groupies. The fondly applied term doesn't seem to offend the fairer sex, though. Maybe because most of them are just as savvy about motocross as the guys are. I think mainly we're uh, ego boosters. You have to tell them how good they are all the time. Not really, but try to make them think, you know, and make sure that everything goes smooth for them, you know, as much as you can. I mainly make sure his helmet's clean and his goggles are clean and everything's where it's supposed to be at. And when he comes in, he's got, you know, a cold towel and some drinks. It's not a hard thing, you know. <laughs> he's the one, you know, it's his, it's his racing and I just have to kind of do what's best for him, I guess. I do for things for myself during the week. Weekends are his, his days. For the unsponsored rider just starting out, the grind is even tougher. No fancy factory vans complete with hot and cold running mechanics and equipment there to back you up. Sometimes the only confidence around here comes from the special people who care enough to turn the campsite into a cycle pit. It would sure be easier to sit at home propped up in front of the two. But these motocross moms and dads are having a better time without any of the usual generation gaps experienced between young and, well, let's say, not so young. We still have our 250YZ that we had. We had some problems with it. Now we have a backup bike, and we also have it for parts. Before, we didn't. A lot of times, you, it's pretty expensive to, when you're trying to sponsor yourself to uh, carry enough parts, and you can go out and break something, you know, in the first moto or something, and you're out. We're a factory. They have parts. Now we're, uh, we have two bikes, and we feel we can use the other one for parts. If my mother, my grandmother, my aunt, all my older relatives uh, think that motorcycling is hell because they hear of the Hells Angels, they see the movies like The Wild Ones, which did less for motorcycling than anybody can desire. Today we're fighting that image by the families coming out at motocross. Well, all the family groups, it's all, it's putting it down and, and bringing motocross up to showing that it's a good sport and not a dirty sport, and I think it is. I've spent the last five years every Sunday with my son. How many other fathers can say that? 
I went and watched him one day at a race, you know, and, and uh, it was super hot, man. I, I could hardly stand it out there, you know, as, as a spectator. But I, I just, as, as watching him, you know, I just kind of got interested, and I decided, man, that's what I got to do. I got to do that. So I, I started, and I haven't stopped yet. Sometimes you feel like, you know, you, you just can't make it. You know, you gonna might as well give up. But it, you get that fever, you know, say like Monday or Tuesday, uh, you know, you feel real bad or something like that. If you didn't do good Sunday, you feel like, well, I don't want to do no more. But come uh, Thursday or Friday, <laughs> you feel like going back there Sunday, you know, and doing it again. I know a guy that, you know, broke his leg three times, and he's still doing it. Same leg. The independent rider, the privateer, is truly the hero of motocross. Such a guy, Jim West. Oh, it's a great sport. The summer, it's hard in the summer, you know. Boy, I, you know, I don't have a lot of meat in my bones, and man, when I sweat, you know, I, my energy is just going out. Well, I mainly just try and make enough money, you know, to pay for everything. It's pretty hard. Week to week, you know, yeah. What you make, it's, you know, it's pretty hard. It costs a lot for everything, you know, gas, food, food costs a lot. You got to eat good food, you know, to stay healthy. We cook out a lot. A lot cheaper, you know. Yeah, and it's salt and butter food. You know, you go to restaurants and stuff, and you, you never get what you want, and it's usually bad food. You feel bad after you eat it. So, you know, he has a stove and everything in here, and it's really easy, you know, to cook something. It's great, though. We have a lot of fun. One guy has a job that may even be harder than the riders. In his hands rests the monumental job of keeping that bike revved and purring from start to finish despite the best efforts of nature and mechanical laws to slow it down. Those hands are, of course, those of the mechanic. Because motocross points are added up on a weekly basis and counted toward the championship, finishing each race can be more important sometimes than winning any particular event in the series. None of the factory teams can chance a breakdown, especially in 500cc nationals with just five races in that series. A DNF did not finish one week can ruin a rider's chance and he loses all the marbles. Each rider selects a mechanic at the beginning of the season to be assigned only to his bike. And for the rest of the year, they are inseparable. And hopefully, it becomes a dynamic duo. Pierre Carsmaker's mechanic is Roy Turner. It takes three or four days generally to prepare the bike because you have to completely rebuild the engine. You have to uh, uh, just do everything, you know, I guess. You, you can't just let any one thing go. It's, I don't know, like the old saying, uh, chain's only as strong as the weakest link. So if there's any one thing you leave unattended, then uh, you're going to have problems. You have to have to check everything. The guys that ride these bikes, they're, uh, they're quite demanding of the bikes. And uh, they, after one race day, the bikes are they're totally whipped. They're pretty useless. And so it takes, it takes quite a bit of maintenance to keep them running. If you have any, any big problems, then it gets a little hectic. You know, maybe changing an engine or something if you suck some dirt. Or, but hopefully, if you do everything, you don't have those kind of problems. Anything that is going to give us a problem we generally uh, have uh, had problem with before, know about it, and it's being worked on modifying the problem so we don't have problems. But we can generally watch out for it, correct any, any things that might be malfunctioning. Will all flagmen please take their positions at this time? And if we could immediately, while we're waiting for those flagmen, if we could have, I believe Tony DeStefano is down here, and Pierre Karsmeckers, if he has one moment, if he could please come to the tower, Marty Smith, Brad Lackey, please, if you could come down to the tower just for a moment. While we're waiting for a couple of the other riders, those of you, we are down here... On race day, the riders are apprehensive about the upcoming duel in the dirt. 
Most prefer to stay out of sight and privately psych themselves for battle. The winner of the 500, pardon me, of the 250 championship for this year. And I'd like to ask Tony a couple of questions about the 500 championship. Tony, first of all, how old are you, Tony? I'm 18 years old. 18 years old. I tell you, most of the kids today, the guys that are really going fast are, are young, and it's, I think it's harder for the older fellas to, to really compete. Uh, Tony, you did an excellent job in, in the 250 class and winning that, and you had a real close race uh, with Howard and through the whole thing. But what can you tell us about the 500 class? How are you doing in the 500 class, and, and, and what do you think your chances are for getting that one also? Well, I'm going to try to go for the 500 class also, but uh, so far, the first race in Kansas, I DNF had some gearbox problems, and then last week in New York, I uh, crashed in the first heat on the first lap, and a uh, better rear shock, and just had to go around that nine, so really, I'm really down on points, I only have 20 points, but there's three more races left, and anything can really happen, so just try to go 100% and see what happens. It's going to be determined at the last race, so we'll see there. On the smaller 125cc bikes, young Marty Smith of San Diego, California has no equal. The young teammate of Pierre Carsmakers on the Honda crew seems to win constantly with only token resistance from challengers. I like rough tracks. Like, I don't like too smooth of tracks. But you can't separate the slower riders from the faster riders, you know, and everybody goes at the same speed. The Europeans, it's kind of fun to ride against because they're supposed to be the best, you know? And, uh, kind of kind of let you know where you stand with them if you can ride with them and you can pick up a lot of hints a lot of tips from them while you while they pass them you know and you, while you follow them and stuff it helps you out a lot it helps american riders out a lot um i like to do it as long as i feel good on the bike and you know i, I if i get too old where i think it's dangerous i'll quit you know do you ever think it's dangerous oh yeah it's dangerous but as long as you just take care of yourself out there and oh, use your head it, no, it'll be all right. If you get a lot of practice on the bike before you can ride it, it helps a lot. You know, if you get out there and it's a strange bike, it makes it all that harder to ride on a strange track too, you know? People are, are, that ride it are, are building the sport up. It used to be that people, people who ride motorcycles were hell's angels and stuff. Now uh, family's getting into it. That's what we need. Family, family's really in, involved in it now. It's all organized. It's, it's not a bunch of kids running. It's, it's uh, growing up, you know, older men and women into it. No, it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be bigger than football and baseball pretty quick. For many riders, the toughest part of any race is the start, getting off the line. Tension is thick as they line up behind the gate at Lake Sugar Tree in Virginia. If you get off the line well, you're in the best position to run with the leaders. A weak start means picking grit out of your teeth and trying to work your way through the 40 guys up front. With all that traffic, the start and first turn are also where crashes are most likely to occur. From local amateurs to seasoned pros, the start oftentimes is Collision City. Sugar Tree is a good, fast track. Lots of room for passing. After spending the previous week behind the pack, Steve Stackable got his bike to burn up the track and take the first moto. Brad Lackey played it cool, settled for second place. The Dutchman had problems with a thrown rear chain. And Jam and Jimmy just wasn't charged up enough to run with the leaders.
former world champ Rolf Tiblin of Sweden will be the first to tell you that training and conditioning make the difference in the ups and downs of motocross. It's hard work, and for this uh, young guys, they're American, they, many of them don't understand that it's so important to take care of themselves. And they don't understand this takes three, four, five, six, seven years before you really get up there. And many guys can't take it. The guy can get up to a point, but that's it. You have to, you have to work your heart and lungs, and you have to work your muscles, and you have to ride your bike. There's three different things. And now that, all these three things, you have to coordinate these three things, and then you get up there. And then you have to understand it takes time. You know, that's hard work. were on Billy Grossi and Marty Smith as they banged fenders over first place. The spectators couldn't believe that these two youngsters were showing up the big bike pros. Marty eventually nudged out Sugar Bear near the end of the second moto to win it. Blackie pulled in for third. Weiner relatively trudged in a distant sixth. Winning second and third place for two motos gave Brad Lackey a nice welcome home victory, the overall title at Lake Sugar Tree. I didn't get as good a start this one as I did the first one. So uh, I just hung in there consistent and a couple guys dropped out and I passed a couple and good enough for the overall. That's all that matters, 150 points. That's some good luck. That always helps. I mean, there's so many things involved. You gotta be in good shape. You gotta have the best bike. You gotta get a good start. You can have good luck that no crazy guys knock you down or your bike don't break. And there's a lot of things involved. I missed the first two races, and this is the third one. And there's only five. And I have now 150 points, probably in about fifth or sixth place. It's hard to, I missed two races and there's only five, so it's gonna be difficult. Really, compared to what he looked like last week? A dejected jammer, Jim Weinert pulled out a not so good fifth place overall in the race. He was thoroughly disgusted with himself and felt the championship might be slipping away. Just some guys were on I'll tell you what, maybe I have next week. That's for sure. He had to do something to build up his lead, and he had no idea things would get worse before they got better. Jim Weinert's father provides an insight into the earlier days of the champ's career. Yeah, his first bike was a CZ without a motor in it. We let him used to coast down a hill in the back of the shop. One day he coasted down the hill into a plate glass window. <laughs> broke the window. And when I come home, the window was, well, had a big crack in it, just from one point to the other. And his mother come out and he says to her, he says, now this is, this is just what he says. He says, that damn old fool gave me this motorcycle just so I could break the window. And we left that window in there for, for about two years ago, and we just had a change because it just had that one crack in it all the way across, you know, a reminder. 
he was the only kid that ever got a wart in between the thumb and the first finger. We didn't know what it was. We took him to the doctor because it was growing. And he says, well, it looks like a wart. Now, how could he get it? So someone backed over that motorcycle, that bicycle. That was it. Mm. And he didn't go riding, and it disappeared. And that's the guy's honest truth. Then the doctor said that's what it could have been, the fortune. And he not only rode it forwards, he rode that thing backwards. And he was riding that motorcycle backwards, and the father didn't know it for two or three years. Flagman in place. And yeah, we're getting ready to start this. The bikes are starting now. Let's make sure everybody's off the track and we're ready to go here. We want to look for number 25, Brad Lackey, riding a Husqvarna, won the first medal. And number 14, Billy Grassi on a Suzuki, was in second place. So those are 500 cc motocross national race number four ohio international raceway near akron the natural terrain rough hilly muddy and long the course is nearly two miles it's a lot like the european circuits and another win for lackey the european expert could possibly put him into the series lead brad lackey would do his best Artistry of motocross is not always evident to the spectator. The noise, speed, and flying dirt tend to blur the image of it all. But make no mistake about it, there's a lyrical beauty in the movements of these gritty gladiators. Quiet the roar, slow the action down, and you can really appreciate the marriage of man and machine that is motocross. Nice, but not entirely realistic. Now this is what you call realism. Like we said, motocross runs under all kinds of terrain and weather conditions. 
number 14, Billy Glassie, is taking over second place. Something must have happened. Number 21, Pierre Cosmic is third, and Tony the second over. Two off the track. Number 21, Pierre Cosmic is third, and Tony the second over. Two off the track. A good point here for the first four positions. There he goes, back on the fourth place, number three, Tony the second hour. Brad Lackey was the odds-on favorite for the second moto as he grabbed the lead off the line, but after only four laps, his front tire went flat. Tony DeStefano seized the opportunity to move up and around the flattened Lackey, but Tony crashed just as he tried to make his move. Grossi then tried to take over and easily got the lead when Lackey's flat front tire washed him out in a turn. Jim Weiner, a study in frustration. During the first moto, his Yamaha ran poorly. In the second, it just rolled over and died. If he'd only been able to cross the finish line, he could have held on to his lead in the championship. Instead, Billy Grossi took the overall win, and with it, the points lead. A dejected Jimmy walked instead of raced across the finish line and got last place points. Darkness descended on the track, it started to rain, but Jimmy Weiner was gloomier than the weather. Time for the big one, the final showdown. And all roads led to way down yonder, New Orleans. Never before in the history of American motocross had one race meant so much. The top riders remember the days not long ago when doing it in the dirt was as much for fun as for profit. But that's all changed now in direct proportion to growing financial stakes and that bitter battle between factories to boast the national championship bike and rider. Motocross had come a long way, and the Battle of New Orleans was sure to be a thrilling one. There was little interest in sampling the sights offered by one of the world's most interesting cities. Everyone was tensely waiting the finale of this dramatic series. Six riders had a mathematical chance at gaining the number one plate if only they could make a good showing here on Labor Day. Billy Grossi held the points lead. Weiner, Stackable, and Carsmakers were all close behind. If those four leaders had serious problems, Ken Howerton or Brad Lackey could also claim number one. They were dark horse contenders, but still in the race. The advertising and publicity value 
of winning the 500cc championship would be tremendous for the factories. All of them wanted this one and wanted it badly. And the riders knew they had to look good here or that factory contract might not be there next year. Pierre Carsmakers didn't join in the small talk around the hotel. Instead, he sat quietly in his room, or rather in the room where his bike was checked in, and he watched the Honda mechanic completely tear down the machine. The oldest of the top contenders, Carsmakers takes this unique business very seriously. You know, a lot of young kids, they think, oh, Pierre Carsmakers, he makes his money very easy, but that's not true, because I've worked, you know, six, seven years as at it, you know, the way I am now, and uh, it's actually every week you make a little progress and learn little things, and uh, it, it takes all that. It's the same like, you know, being a race car driver or, be, or being a football player or a tennis player. Uh, I'm sure those guys have to uh, get, you know, their results from their background also, from experience and from making mistakes and learning the hard way. I think that's the best way to learn anyway. Of course, there are always uh, younger guys that are, you know, very, very talented. But normally with those guys, you see that, you know, if they make a mistake and if they, for example, get injured pretty bad or something, that for them it's much, much harder to come back, you know, and, and win races again. Compared with a guy that has to work harder at it, he's more determined and uh, you know, you, you're sure he's going to come back because he's been through it before. And uh, motocross is a very good sport. I like it a lot, and uh, I think I'm going to do it as long as I keep liking it. I think motocross is really going to grow, especially in the next two, three years, because right now in America, it seems like we're going to the indoor type races, and that way, the public, the spectators, they can sit, you know, in the in the grandstands and have their coffee and use clean bathrooms and take their kids to the races and enjoy a good nights a good night of racing or maybe a Sunday afternoon of racing. And uh, I think that's you know the American way of motocross. It's putting it in a stadium. I really believe so. So uh, we'll see what happens in the next couple of years. Like in, in Europe, I've, I've watched motocross and I've raced motocross a long time in Europe and, you know, it's, st it's still at the same level and every year, you know, it stays at the same level. There's no, you know, expansion at all. So I think uh, the way the American promoters are doing it now is going to be the way to do it. You know, of course, I like to race in, out in the, in the woods and in the, in the countryside a lot too. But, uh, you know, why are football players playing in a stadium? They don't do it in the meadows, you know. Close friends Weinert and Lackey reflected on their personal treks to the top in motocross. Ohio, I think, back in about 71 it was, I think, or 72. 70. 70, wasn't it? First, trans First Trans Am, man. And we were just wide open. We were riding for the CZ factory at the time, you know. And then they were helping us with bikes and parts, and that was lucky. Yeah. We started out as privateers, and we did the same thing. Drove across country in our own van, we paid for everything, people. bought our own motorcycles, broke down every Sunday or one, and, you know, we got it together enough to win some races to get a sponsor, and then you go up from there. And it's up to everybody to do the same thing, you know. You can't give a guy so much help just because he's a private guy, you know. He's got to earn it like everybody does. Don't plans for next year. Any plans yet? Early Labor Day morning, and the battle lines were being drawn on a man-made, mile-long course along the banks of the Mississippi River near New Orleans. Motocross West offered every imaginable condition, from rough sand whoop de doos to bike-breaking downhill drop-offs. And there was another condition that everybody could have done without, searing heat and stifling humidity. The course was laid out between two levees, and it had the potential of becoming a dust bowl by the end of the day. Conditioning was bound to be a major factor in this furnace-like environment. 
just sitting still drain moisture from every pore. 15,000 fans jammed into the track to await this, the deciding title event. And they wouldn't be disappointed. Strategies were long since devised. Suzuki was counting on Grassi with the highest point total in their camp to win the race. His teammate, Tony DiStefano, wasn't talking about his job, but everyone suspected team strategy. Tony would go all out, but with any sort of setback, he could hang back and run interference for Billy. Lackey was obviously fastest in the Husqvarna camp, but Team Husky's Howerton had a few more series points. Would Brad slow up and let Kent claim the checkered flag if Howerton could overcome his sprained wrist and run with the leader? Everybody else was on his own. $20,000 in prize money, factory bonuses, and contracts could run the bucks up to $50,000. Winning meant everything. Second place would be a footnote in the history of motocross. Just when it seemed that nothing could add to the tension and anxiety, something did. At the start of the first moto, the gate failed to drop properly, and there was a big pile up in the first turn. Everyone was called back for a restart as they tried again for the opening shot of the war.
relax it on you. was sticking on those straightaways and spectator was coming. Spectator, like I came in after you, you know? Yeah. And now the dune pass just followed Jimmy. And then I just followed you guys and then Stack came by and, and he would have got Jimmy, but he broke his wheel. So I knew how to handle it. The air cleaner, we gotta get the air cleaner. Wet and dust were taking a toll. The riders lay exhausted between motos. Several took oxygen to overcome dizziness. This was surely a fight of the fittest. And the final moto seemed maddeningly slow in getting started. The delay of almost an hour intensified the drama. Immediately. All spectators back behind the spectator fences. Flagman, report to your positions immediately. Flagman, to your positions immediately. The sun is setting slowly in the west, as they say, and we do want to get this one completed before the sun goes down. The 500cc bikes are on the line, and we're going to decide among the six riders who came into this event today with a mathematical probability of winning it, or at least a mathematical possibility of winning the national title, who it is that takes home all the gold in AMA 500cc National Motocross competition this year. It's going to come down to this on on a Sunday afternoon near New Orleans, Louisiana for six individuals who all have a shot to become number one here today. If you were by chance a latecomer, you missed a good first moto, and in that first moto, the winner was Brad Lackey, Panola, California. Brad is the sixth rider in that sixth tent with a possibility to do it. The only way Bradley could come away with the national title would be if everybody in that first five would fail to score a point today, and Brad could win it. I won moto number one, and he could easily win moto number two and still not be the national champ, depending on what would happen with those other five. But he does have that slim mathematical possibility of making it. Second in the first moto was Jim Weiner. Third, Pierre Carsmakers on bikes number one and number 21, respectively. 
Fourth place went to bike number five, Gary Semix. Fifth to Billy Grossi on number 14, who really had to come through traffic to finish in fourth and fifth spot. Fifth to Billy Grossi, number 14. Slowly, everyone made their way back to the starting line for the final moto. Stomachs nodded as the riders waited for the course to be water. Although it started off nice and loamy, the track had turned to talcum powder after a full day of racing and baking in the sun, and dust was a real problem. A picturesque sunset brought a merciful drop in temperatures, but everyone was glancing nervously at their watches to see if there was enough daylight left to finish off the Nationals. Finally, with 40 minutes of light remaining, and with an AMA official standing by to call it off if it got too dark, the last gate for the last moto fell. The one-minute warning is up. The one-minute warning is up. Remember, when he turns that sign sideways, you'll have two to ten seconds before the gates will drop. took the lead off the line, but before the first lap could be sorted out, cars makers skyrocketed to the lead with Weiner back in eighth position. was worse. A rider fell directly in Sugar Bear's line. He took a nosedive, cartwheeled, and jammed his bike under a fence. As people ran to assist him, Grossi yelled them away. According to AMA rules, any outside assistance and you're disqualified. It took a whole lap for him to work it free. Sugar Bear was surely out of the running for the title. Suddenly, Lackey blasted around cars makers, but instead of trying to put some distance between them, he deliberately stayed right in front of the Dutchman's number plate. After letting Pierre rub the rear fender of his Husky for about five laps, Brad seemed to actually let Pierre back into the lead. Lackey was obviously touting cars makers by spurting ahead, then dropping back and edging near Pierre's front wheel. some of the tricks he'd picked up in Europe, Brad was paying Pierre back for the rough tactics he claimed the Dutchman used against him the previous week. Carsmakers was visibly upset at Brad's stalling techniques and shook his fist at Lackey as they rocketed down the straightaway.
After teaching Pierre his lesson, Lackey began to stretch his lead, but it didn't last long. His motor had sucked in so much of the rich levy sand that it lost compression and quit running. Pierre inherited the lead and almost sure chance at the championship if he could only finish. Meanwhile, Weinert was suffering from heat exhaustion and the best he could do was hold on to sixth place. There seemed to be no chance of catching and passing cars makers. But the race was far from over. Tony DiStefano moved up on Cars Makers, Semex, and Stackable to start a four-way battle for the lead. Honda's would-be champion held the front-running position when Lackey dropped out, but now Tony was challenging him for first place. Suddenly, disaster struck, ending all hopes for Honda to have victory circle. Coming over an uphill jump, Tony and Pierre were side by side for the lead. Ten feet in midair, the bikes drifted together and knocked both riders out of control. Weinert got around cars makers after the crash and, despite his physical exhaustion, stayed ahead of him until the finish. Darkness engulfed the track as the final minutes of the moto ticked away. Stackable now held the lead ahead of Tripes and Semix. The jammer jogged along in fourth place. All of the riders who could have beaten Jimmy Weinert just a few hours before, Lackey, Grossi, Howerton, Carsmakers, and Stackable were either out of the running or too far down in the day's point standings to challenge the skinny kid from New York. An exhausted, jamming Jimmy Weinert wobbled across the finish line in fourth position, good enough to claim his second consecutive 500cc national motocross title. He made his way to the Yamaha pits, only to collapse completely spent by the physical exhaustion of the race. His strong determination to finish brought him across the checkered flag to victory, and as night quickly blanketed the track, Weinert thanked his lucky stars for winning the big one in New Orleans. And we won it. We did? Yeah, we won overall. Oh, now we get loose tonight. Yeah. I stay in here. Sorry, Kathy, but <laughs> Jim Weinert and Bill Bushka are again at the top of the motocross world, having won the national title for Yamaha the season-long saga that culminated in near darkness on the Mississippi Riverbanks outside New Orleans was one of the great stories in the history of motorcycle sport. The motocross equation is a complex one. It includes a reliable and fast machine, finely tuned by a master mechanic, torturous hours spent in physical conditioning, a liberal dose of natural riding talent honed through practice and experience, it takes determination to overcome the bad racing luck, such as we saw today for several of the top competitors, and the quick wit to capitalize on racing's good fortunes. National champion Jimmy Weiner and Bill Bushka have put it all together. Well, now I can retire. <laughs> it's great. That's all you can say. Oh, thank you. I got, I'll just hold it here for a second. Mac, come here, you can have it. Bill, Mac, come here, have a sip of this. If I do, I get sick, you know. <laughs> I'll take a little sip, because I should.
And so motocross keeps growing, Sunday after Sunday and year after year. The competition gets keener, the racing faster and tougher. For Jimmy Weinert, hanging on to that title will be a bigger challenge next year. There are always faster, meaner competitors right behind, catching up fast, just itching to take that number one plate away. Sooner or later, he'll have to give it up. Special thanks to Tony DiStefano, Billy Grossi, Pierre Carsmaker, Brad Lackey, Steve Stackable, Jimmy Weinert, 